who got his uh, doctorate from the University of Florida and bachelor's and master's from ODU. And he studies the trophic cascades um, of heterosexual relationships and how that has um, impacts for the ecology and the ecosystems and their functions. Um, I'd like to ask, are there any departmental notifications or announcements that we should uh, know about? No, good, perfect. And uh, I wanted to announce that we do have happy hour uh, this afternoon. It will be at the Block T Bar, which is a new place for us. It's in the conference center and hotel here on campus, right next to Kyle Stadium. All right, so if we can't find it, we can try and get a group together and walk together, or we can try and find it. It's in the second floor of that new building, right next to NSC and Kyle Field. All right. Um, so he's been an associate professor, just recently promoted mm -hmm. to associate professor at East Carolina University. And I'd like to you can read the title. So <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone for inviting me here. I've really enjoyed my visit so far, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with many more of you um, after the talk. Um, so in putting this talk together today, I started to think about, like, what, would I, what should I talk about? Because I have a pretty diverse lab group that works on a variety of topics. And so I started, decided to go back to my primary research interest, which is in predator-prey interactions. And to think about it, I, I said, well, maybe I should start with what kind of inspired me down this route to study predator-prey interactions. And in fact, it was a paper that I read as a young graduate student by Hairston, uh, Smith, and Slobodkin, which has become known as the why, the why is the world green hypothesis. And what the, the reason this paper kind of struck me is not just because of the content, but it's because of the approach. It's kind of a pithy thought experiment with no data using a set of logical constructs that from first principles ask the question, why are there plants when there's so many herbivores around? And the logical conclusion from that was that it must be because they're regulated by predators, that predators must regulate herbivores and therefore we have green plants. Otherwise, the earth would be denuded of green litter. And so it seemed like a really you know, obvious thing, but it's now been cited a huge number of times. And so it's been a hugely influential paper and kind of set the framework for what we understand from modern food web ecology, for how we can predict what ecosystems should look like. And there's been lots of work on this, even recently, showing that predators are really important for ecosystems. For example, this is from a relatively recent paper just showing the effects of losses of large predators from, from ecosystems where you can actually have complete transitions of these ecosystems from one type to another. For example, from a kelp forest to a mud flat in the loss of these sea otters. And so we know that predators have these large cascading effects on food webs. A second influential thing I read was a book called Food Webs, Integration of Pattern and Process that was edited by Gary Polis and Kirk Weinmiller. And so it was an edited volume. And in this volume, ideas like trait-mediated interactions or phenotypic plasticity and how it can change the way species interact was introduced by Peter Abrams. And a paper by Bob Holt on food webs in space that sort of laid out that these trophic cascades, represented here, actually occur in a spatial context and the distributional range of, of movement of the organisms that are in that cascade can actually change the dynamics we expect on a landscape scale. So I'm going to try to tie those things together today and talk about four different projects. Hopefully I have time to get through them all. Um, that I've done over the years that sort of represent this sort of uh, motivation that I received from these early readings. The first thing I want to talk about is some of my older work, which is on trophic interactions that span ecosystem boundaries. Then I want to tell you a little bit about multiple predator effects, and this is going to be more of a statistical paper that I've done recently. Um, and then talk about these multiple predator effects across ecosystem boundaries. And then in the end, I want to talk about my most recent work, which is developing some new theory to help predict how predator diversity affects ecosystem function. So this idea for food webs in space was something that sort of captured me. And I also have a long-standing interest in complex life cycles. And so I added to this original paper by Holt and others by talking about what happens when you have these trophic cascades occurring in two different ecosystems, for example, in a pond and in the surrounding terrestrial matrix. And those interactions are linked obligately by complex life cycles. For example, in an amphibian that must reproduce in the water and then metamorphose and interact in the terrestrial community. So you have these repeated obligate interactions across ecosystem boundaries that affect the trophic dynamics occurring in each of those habitats. And so the first project I did as a graduate student 
ask the question, do fish affect terrestrial plants via this kind of trophic cascade via complex life cycles? So we know that in pond systems that fish eat large invertebrates and therefore can have influences on the diversity and abundance of small invertebrates. And we know in things like terrestrial landscapes, we can have inverse trophic cascades where predators of pollinators of a symbiont can negatively affect plants by reducing pollinator abundance. But in this case, these two habitats share something in common, and that is this larval dragonfly turns into an adult dragonfly. And so fish could therefore indirectly influence the reproduction of terrestrial plants via this cascade across these ecosystem boundaries. So we set out to test this hypothesis, and we went to a site in Florida, and we identified ponds that either contained fish or that were fish free, and the ponds were similar in size and, and other characteristics, and we just collected a bunch of observational data to sort of test this idea. So the first result we got is that we went to ponds with fish and without fish, and we found that there were many more dragonfly, oh, this is supposed to say larvae, sorry, many more dragonfly larvae at ponds without fish than there were at ponds with fish, sort of supporting this idea that fish are eating dragonfly larvae, which we already knew, but this is sort of confirmation of that. And we also saw that same pattern in the number of adult dragonflies flying around those ponds. Again, ponds without fish had many more dragonflies than ponds with, with fish, and there was also a shift in the size structure to more large dragonfly species than small dragonfly species. Those would be more likely to harass pollinators. Our next data we collected was on actual pollinator visitation rates. So to ask the question, do fish indirectly affect pollinator abundance? So we went to plants, and I'm only showing you a part of the data. We did this for several species. And we just counted the number of pollinator visits to shrubs or other flowers, in this case a Sagittaria, over a fixed time interval. And again, we saw that those plants near ponds with fish received many more pollinator visits than those plants near ponds without fish. So this suggested that at least there was some association between fish and pollinator abundance. That didn't necessarily translate into effects on the plants, though, unless that led to reductions in uh, pollen transfer efficiency. So in our final experiment, we actually asked whether or not the fish actually reduced the, the effectiveness of the pollinators. And so here I'm just showing you the magnitude of pollen limitation. And so you can see that plants near uh, ponds with fish actually were more pollen limited, and therefore produced fewer seeds than plants near ponds with fish. And we did this for a naturally occurring plant, and we also did it with experimentally placed plants that we brought in from the outside. And we saw the same thing in both. So through the study, we were actually able to show that through this sort of cascade of indirect effects, that fish were indirectly influencing the reproductive uh, biology of these terrestrial plants. And so this was a, you know, kind of a, an interesting story, and I started to think, well, this is just talking about plants occurring around the edge of the pond, and so we might expect those effects to actually vary as you move away from the edge of the pond. And so this led to a second follow-up study, which asked, well, as these organism complex life cycles emerge from the water, they're going to be in higher abundance near the pond than they are away from the pond. So you might actually get this sort of cascade or shadow effect, what I call it a predator shadow, as these organisms emerge from the pond and disperse into the surrounding landscape, their impacts on the terrestrial food web might actually be reduced as they either die or the spatial sort of dilution effect. And so you might ask yourself, could this actually be a strong effect? And this reminded me of some, some observations I made uh, in uh, the Ocala National Forest in Florida, where if you look at this pond margin here, you see all this little dark matter here, it looks like dirt, but if you zoom in a little closer, it turns out that's actually thousands of metamorphosing toads, spadefoot toads in this case. And all of those individuals are dispersing into the surrounding terrestrial landscape and consuming biomass. So, and they're all emerging at the same time. So that's a nice just-so story, but about the same time, a paper came out by Whit Gibbons showing that at this one Carolina Bay, which is one of these circular ponds here that are common along the East Coast, over a single season, he quantified more than 360,000 amphibians metamorphosing out of a pond and emerging into the <laughs> terrestrial landscape. That's over 1,500 kilograms of biomass consuming terrestrial insects. And so Witt was nice enough to send me all of his data. So he had not only data on abundance, but on the sizes of all those individuals. And so we used that to sort of build a little model. So this is modeled after the pond that he collected these data from. 
And I just used some metabolic scaling functions to sort of estimate how much insect biomass these amphibians would have consumed in this particular uh, location during the season. <coughs> and so what I'm just showing you here is near the edge of the pond, the warmer colors are stronger trophic cascade effects. And as you move away from the pond, it's a shadow effect where we expect those to get de decreased as the organisms disperse into the terrestrial landscape. And what I estimated is that those amphibians would have consumed about six million insects per day, the number that emerged from that pond. So that's a huge number of insects. And then based on sweep net studies around the Carolina Bay, I determined that about 40% of the insects living in these habitats were herbivores. And so this trophic cascade is calculated based on this percentage of herbivores. And if we place that in a, whoops, sorry. If we place that in a larger context, because these Carolina Bays don't typically occur in isolation, we actually see that this kind of predator shadow effect overlaps when you have multiple ponds close together. And you can get incredibly strong trophic cascade effects by these emerging animals from the pond environment to the terrestrial environment. And it actually generates quite a bit of spatial variation in the landscape and the strength of these trophic cascades. Now, where this might become important is if you now start thinking about management strategies, if you're going to introduce fish for mosquito control or for game management or whatever, where you put those fish in this landscape can actually have huge implications for the surrounding terrestrial landscape and the impact it has on trophic cascades. So for example, here I'm just showing you in the same system, which is where we did the first study, those ponds with fish, I sort of quantified, estimated the effect of fish on those, trophic, on those uh, emerging amphibians and what the trophic cascade would look like. And what we see is that we get, by adding fish to a fraction of those ponds, we get about a 1,200 kilogram increase in plant consumption. Okay. So that's by reducing the number of amphibians or increasing the insects' impact on the surrounding terrestrial landscape. And that's a huge reduction in biomass production. So these can be big effects. Okay. So That's sort of uh, the first little story I want to tell you about. Now the second story came from now thinking about not how single predators affect these trophic cascades, but how do multiple predators affect these trophic cascades. And this is sort of more recent work. And in order to do that, we first need to explore the sort of theory that underlies how we estimate these sort of trophic cascades and multiple predator effects. And hopefully that'll become clear in a minute why we need to do that. And the reason I'm interested in multiple predator effects is because we don't typically think of most prey as having a single predator. They actually often share many predators. And so we really need to be able to understand these sort of conglomerate or aggregate effects if we really want to understand the sort of ecosystem level impacts of these organisms. So a quick tour of the theory. Um, trophic cascades are, can be simply described with a series of lotka volterra equations. So you don't need to worry about the equations. I've highlighted the important parts. And that is the negative effects of an herbivore on the plant is represented by the recruitment of the herbivore, herbivore and its consumption of the plant. And the negative effect of a predator on that herbivore is determined again by the predation rate of the predator and its abundance and recruitment into that system. So we can describe this trophic cascade where the top predator indirectly affects the plant by changing the abundance of this intermediate consumer. But more recent work, over, especially over the last decade or so, has sort of pointed out that these guys aren't just simply eaten, they might actually be able to respond to the predators in a way that changes this interaction and makes it harder to predict. So for example, if this herbivore makes behavioral decisions that minimizes its risk of being found by this predator, but maximizes its ability to find the most nutritious resources, we need to incorporate another element into our theory. So for example, here I'm just showing that if we call this optimal foraging here, this FOP, is just maximizing the ratio of your growth, so that's the recruitment part of the equation, and minimizing the mortality risk, that's the predation rate part of the equation, and we incorporate that into the theory, things get a little bit more complicated. So for example, we just added these terms here, which is adjusting those uh, parts of the equation for this behavioral shift by the herbivore. And what we see is now things that happen with the plants actually affect the behavior of the predators. And so the whole system's become context dependent. And it makes it much more difficult to predict these simple trophic cascades that we would have predicted based on changes in abundance alone. Now the reason I went through this is because you can imagine if we now add multiple predators, the whole thing becomes even more complicated because the predators can affect each other 
and avoid each other, which changes the behavior of the prey, which changes the behavior of the predators, and the system is now very difficult to predict. Because of this, over the last, I don't know, 30 years or so, most of the work on these questions have just focused on quantifying these emergent multiple predator effects, those parts of the effect that we can't quantify or can't predict very effectively. So how do we do that? Well, typically, we do studies where we take one of the predators and we quantify the survival rate of prey in the presence of that predator in isolation. And then we'll do it, calculate the same thing for a second predator. So in this case, we have our survival with predator one and survival with predator two. And then we try to make a prediction of what we would expect the survival of prey to be if those two predators occurred and, were, and interacted as independent predators on that same prey. And we do that with what's called the multiplicative risk model. And this was proposed by way back or, or popularized by Andy C. back in the 80s. And it's just saying that predicted survival in the presence of both predators is going to be the survival with the first predator multiplied by the survival of the second predator. So it's just the probabilities. And you can correct that for some background mortality rate or survival rate. So in this case, we would predict, just assuming background survival is 100%, that we would get 33% of these herbivores surviving. So this is what we would observe maybe, let's say in our experiment. So then what we would conclude is that there's this emergent context dependent effect that's calculated by our expectation of independent predator effects minus our observation. And that's our unpredictable component of the interaction or what's just been called the emergent predator effect. But there's a problem with this. And that is this model which has been used in literally hundreds of studies, assumes or conflates predictable nonlinear effects of predator-prey interactions with these more less predictable context-dependent effects. And why does it do that? Well, if we think about a typical experiment where we start off with some number of prey on day one, the beginning of our experiment, and then sometime later, let's say three days later, we quantify how many prey are left and we calculate the per capita mortality or the proportion killed per day, we would say that this was the average mortality rate per day by that predator. But this assumes that the predation rate is constant through time. Right? So in other words, we're assuming, as most of these sort of simple models of trophic interactions assume, that the predators have what's called a type one functional response. In other words, the number of prey eaten increases linearly as prey abundance increases. What that means is that the per capita rate or the proportion killed per day is constant, regardless of how many are there. But we know from literally hundreds and hundreds of studies that most predators have a saturating functional response. In other words, they reach some maximum consumption rate where they can no longer consume any more prey no matter how many are there. Does that make sense? And that's often described by a type two functional response where this attack rate is sort of the initial increase in consumption with increasing prey. And the handling time term here, which is the H, sets the asymptote or the maximum feeding rate. So if we put this into terms of per capita risk, we see that actually per capita risk looks like this. So if we did that same experiment on day one, we would have this per capita risk of being eaten by a predator, and that would change through time as the density changed. So if we go to our approach that we're using, and we say this is what we think per capita risk per day is, and we compare it to our actual risk, we'll see we're going to overestimate the mortality rates with this predator. And if we multiply two predators together now with this expectation, we're always going to be over predicting what those two predators should do to the prey because we haven't accounted for this sort of nonlinearity. And this is referred to as Jensen's inequality, which in my opinion is one of the most important concepts not really paid attention to in ecology. So does this actually matter? Well, so to sort of explore this, I did a quick simulation study. And so what I'm showing you here is the survival of two predators, S1 and S2. In this case, those predators have the exact same attack rate. They are clones of one another. And I just said, okay, what if we apply the multiplicative risk model to this without uh, accounting for those depletion effects? And so this is the predicted survival with both of those predators combined. And this is what you would observe, even if those predators were acting completely independently as the model predicts. So what we see here is we'd get higher survival. We would call that an emergent effect. We would say the predators were interfering with each other in some way and causing risk reduction to the prey, right? That there's some emergent property. But in fact, there's not. There's just bias in the statistical approach, right? 
So now we have hundreds of studies and it's considered pretty much uh, common knowledge that multiple predator effects are, are, are present in most systems. And that's based on hundreds of studies that have used a biased statistic. And I did this for a variety of different experimental designs and different sort of context of changing um, the parameter values. And what makes this really hard to sort of adjust to, because bias itself isn't bad, but the bias can be in any direction. So it can be positive or negative depending on the values of the parameters and the experimental design you use. So that makes it really hard to now go back to the literature and actually synthesize any sort of useful information about multiple predator effects. But it doesn't stop here. It gets worse because these models also assume that every individual in the population is equally vulnerable. Right? For example, it would assume this newborn and this mom have the same vulnerability to the predators. <clears throat> but we know that's generally not true. We know that small individuals on average have higher risk of being eaten than large individuals. And if that relationship of risk to size is nonlinear, we end up with the same problem. Either individuals are size structured at the beginning of the experiment or they grow through time. So again, if we made that average assumption of risk across all individuals, we're going to make the same sort of bias, right? So even in the absence of those depletion effects, so I replenished prey as soon as they were eaten and just had size structure in the model, we see the same sort of bias in any direction, positive, negative, or neutral. So again, we, without knowing anything about the size structure or the size risk relationships, we can't say anything about multiple predator effects based on all these previous studies. So does this actually matter in a real system? Well, to sort of first example of that, I want to talk about some work I did on multiple predator effects across the ecosystem boundaries, which actually I did before I discovered this problem, but it was sort of the thing that led to this uh, recognition. And so the work I want to tell you about was done on red-eyed tree frogs um, and down at Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And this organism was really good for this question for a variety of reasons, um, but mostly because of their life history strategy. So these guys come down between June and December and they deposit their eggs on the undersides of leaves overhanging ponds instead of in the water like most temperate frogs do. Those eggs develop on the leaves for up to seven days. And they hatch into free swimming tadpoles. They drop into the water and then they metamorphose some months later, 30 to 90 days later and return to the canopy. Now what makes these things, uh, this organism really good for this question is that the eggs eaten by a variety of predators. So in particular, a couple of species of wasps and a couple of species of snakes among a few other predators. <coughs> and so you think, you know, you have this big batch of eggs up there, so basically bacon and eggs. You've got this little strip of bacon and some egg on it. And these predators are come in and they're pretty vulnerable to those predators. But it turns out these eggs, these embryos, aren't passive participants in this interaction. So like I said before, that herbivore can move to get away from predators, well, so can these tadpoles. So here I just have a little video, if it works. And so what you'll see is a snake comes in. Oh. There he is. He'll start to attack this clutch of eggs. And you'll start to see some of these embryos dropping out. And this isn't just merely an artifact of the snake tearing open their egg case, they're actually able to detect the vibrational signals of the predator approaching the, the egg mass and they can respond adaptively by releasing a hatching gland inside their mouth that dissolves the egg and they drop into the water. And you'll see that as the snake goes away to swallow its meal, the rest of these embryos will hatch out and drop into the water. And it's pretty fascinating because actually the, the embryos can tell the difference between a snake and a wasp and they actually have different hatching strategies whether it's a wasp where it's only attacking a single egg and only the ones around it will hatch versus those that are attached by a snake where the whole clutch hatches. They can also tell the difference between a snake and rain and wind and other kinds of disturbance. So this is an adaptive response. The effect of that is that it changes the phenotype of the tadpoles in addition to the density dropping into the pond. So now we have here a premature hatchling that hatched in response to a snake predator at four days and a full term hatchling at six days. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference in their developmental stage and also in their size. So the snakes 
or, and other predators reduce the density of tadpoles entering the pond by up to 50% based on several years of survey data, and it changes their phenotype developmentally and in size. And so the question we wanted to ask then is, well, now that they're in the pond, there's a whole different set of predators they're going to interact with. So we have these predators in the terrestrial environment interacting with predators in the aquatic environment, and they're being influenced by this sort of phenotypic response of the tadpoles. And the predator I'm going to talk about today, there are several, is this water bug, which uh, is uh, uh, quite fond of eating these tadpoles. And so we needed to incorporate both those effects of changes in density and changes in size, and we needed to do it in a way that allowed us to make predictions because we needed to know how that risk changed through time and across sizes. And so instead of using a classic experimental design, we used what's called a response re surface regression design. And so here, just showing you, we had for an intermediate tadpole density, the full series, regression series of different size classes. So this is from early hatchling to pre-metamorph. And then we have the full regression series of all densities at an intermediate size. So this allows us to describe a three-dimensional surface across densities and sizes of risk posed by these, by um, a predator. And then these treatment combinations in the corners, they allow us to bound that three-dimensional surface in space so we know exactly where they are. So if we think of another axis here as being number of tadpoles eaten, we can describe that by using this experimental design. And we can leave out these unimportant things because we don't care about doing pairwise comparisons of different densities or sizes. We just want to know the parameter estimates that describe this relationship. And so we know, as I just told you, we can describe the density effect using a type 2 functional response where we have these key parameters, attack rate and handling time. And so that allows us to incorporate this per capita change in risk through time as density changes and the predator eats prey. And then we can incorporate the size effect by just modeling this attack rate term as a function of risk due to size. For example, we have small tadpoles that might be less vulnerable because they are not very nutritionally rewarding to the prey, I mean to the predator. Some intermediate size that might be very nutritious and easy to catch and then large ones might have a size refuge from a predator. We can describe that with something like a Ricker function, which is what I've done here. And we get some really important usable parameters from this model. First, we can describe this A parameter here, which tells us the maximum attack rate. So that's the highest rate of consumption by this predator. We have this S naught term here, which tells us what size tadpole is most vulnerable to that predator. And then this gamma term, which tells us basically how wide this window of maximum vulnerability is. And this will become important later. So now we can describe by fitting the data, whoops, too fast by fitting the data to this sort of three-dimensional surface that I just showed you in two equations. So here we have tadpole size, and you can see this hump-shaped relationship. So for any density, we can describe basically the effect of size. And then if you go into the screen, as tadpole density increases, we have this type two sort of saturating functional response. So now for any size density combination, we know what the expected risk is to a tadpole. So here's just showing you the data back in two dimensions, fit to, the models fit to the data. So same data, just now we have, oops, sorry, that didn't show up there, initial density on the x-axis. And here you can see the size relationship. And the different lines here just represent different densities, showing you those two different relationships in two dimensions. Okay, so now that we have these models fit, oh, I just want to point out, I forgot, I didn't just pick those models randomly. Actually, there's a whole variety of functional responses and a whole variety of risk functions. And we did all these in model comparisons to determine which model best described these data. So it's not just, uh, subjective choice. Okay, so the reason that I talked about that Ricker function and why that's important is because now we also can see why growth is important because as tadpole size increases, you can imagine the rate at which an individual moves through these size classes determines its overall risk. If you're growing really quickly, you're in that window for a much shorter time than if you're growing slowly. So resource environment now can drive the strength of this trophic interaction. And so, I needed to now quantify growth. And again, I did this with two experiments. Um, the first was to sort of determine the effects of density on growth rate. And the second was to determine how resource availability affected growth rate. And so for this first one, I just did a sort of standard density experiment. And for the second one, again, I used this response surface regression design to sort of ask how tadpoles of different body sizes grew under different resource levels. So I had same design as I showed you previously. Now the important part of this is, is that this density experiment was done at the intermediate resource level of this resource experiment. 
And this resource experiment was done at the intermediate density level of this density experiment. And I'll tell you why that matters in a minute. So first we needed to quantify density dependent growth. And so here I'm just showing you the different colors here from white as the lowest density to black as the highest density. And you can kind of see what happened here just from looking at the data. There aren't very many differences in the initial growth rate, but we see huge differences in the final size. And so we can describe this with the standard growth model, in this case a Gompertz function. And again has some parameters that we can look at and sort of figure out what's going on with this, with this density effect. So this term here describes this initial growth rate. This rho naught term here describes the maximum growth rate. And then this new parameter here just describes the cost of size. And we were able to then test which one of these parameters actually explained the greatest amount of variation in this density effect. And it turns out it's this parameter new. So it actually is more expensive to be large when density is high. So you get asymptotic growth sooner and they, start, they stop growing, uh, increasing in size sooner at, at high densities. And so now using a two-stage analytical approach, I can actually now say what's the relationship between this new parameter and density. And here I can just describe now a functional form for how density changes the growth rate of these prey. Okay, so keep that in, in the back of your mind for a minute. Now I needed to take this data and integrate it with the, with the resource effect. And so again, just to remind you, I used this response surface regression design to figure out how body size uh, and resources affected growth rate. Now I'm just going to go straight to the data for this. And so here I'm showing you growth rate. And the reason I have to have growth rate now is because I use different size classes and then looked at change in size over a short time window. Large things are going to change proportionately less than small things. And so we get this expected relationship. Large body size had a smaller proportional change over a small window than small things did. And I can take this original uh, growth curve that I fit here to the density data and you can derive from that a model for relative growth rate as a function of size. And so now all of these parameters are the exact same as in the original model. And I'm just fitting it to growth rate data and it fits pretty well. And so this term here is now this row term, our maximum growth rate. And we know how that changes with body size. And we also know this new term from our previous experiment and how all that's expected to change with density. Now we need to get the resource effect. And the resource is expected to affect maximum growth rate. So again, we could just model that as a function of resource availability. And in this case, we just use the Michaelis-Minton function to show how that's going to change. And so now we can integrate all this into a single model that describes how maximum growth rate is going to change as you change resource availability and we can scale that across densities. Okay. And that's what I did um, to sort of explore what the expected relationship is between these tadpoles and their predators in the aquatic environment given the effect of these terrestrial stage egg predators. And here's just showing you a little simulation from those fitted models so we can take those, incorporate uncertainty and actually make projections about what we would expect under different predator and resource environments. And the key thing I want to show you from this sort of simulation result is that uh, on a short term experiment, we might expect those tadpoles in a low resource environment to have higher survival than those in a high resource environment. But over the duration of the larval period, 30 days, we might expect that pattern to reverse. So it makes it very context dependent. But is this actually something we can predict? And the reason for that context dependence has to do with this window of vulnerability. Early in, in the experiment, those that are in the low resource environment will get to that window of vulnerability slower and therefore have less mortality, but they remain in that window quite a bit longer, 40 percent longer. So their total mortality rate is longer because they're moving through that window of vulnerability at a slower rate. So does this actually pan out? So we needed to do an experiment to test whether or not we actually are able to predict these effects. And so here I'm just going to show you uh, part of the results from, this is an egg stage predator effect, so this will change the density and size of the tadpoles versus a full term no predator effect. We did this at two densities of tadpoles in the aquatic environment and then we're going to show you the results for the Bellostoma predator. And so I generated predictions, so I just sort of simulated that experiment in my model and said, okay, what do we expect to happen? And so I'm going to show you the predictions in red. And so this is a prediction for egg stage predator, I mean no egg stage predator in this case. And we would have predict no effect or a very small effect of early hatching. So that's the size effect in this case. So what did we see? 
what we saw about that. So this is our observed effect of size, you know, that egg stage predator effect on size had very little effect on survival. A prediction for the effect of reducing density was actually an increased survival in this case. And we saw, so we predicted increased survival at lower densities. And again, that's pretty close to what we observed in our experiment. And so this is predicting out 30 days after hatching. Now if we were going to make this additive multiplicative risk type prediction, this is what we'd predict the effect of both predators to be. Slightly higher increase in survival. This is what our model predicted, right? Incorporating those nonlinearities that we know to be actually important in predator-prey interactions predicted a much different effect and that's what we observed. So this does suggest that incorporating these known nonlinearities, and this is actually 30 days out, has high predictive capacity. And in fact, we also were able to predict with high level of accuracy the body sizes of those tadpoles, but I'm going to not have time to present those data today. So just to summarize this part of the talk, we can get these interactions between predators across um, life history stages, in this case across ecosystem boundaries from the terrestrial to the aquatic environment. And Previous work suggested that there are these emergent multiple predator effects that, that come from this phenotypic effect of predators on the eggs, on the tadpoles, but actually if you incorporate known nonlinearities into our models, those non-predictable effects become very predictable. And this is actually allowing us to predict size and abundance of individuals metamorphosing from the pond, which then allows, translates into being able to understand their effect on the terrestrial food web. Okay. Oh. We've done the same thing for the metamorph transition too. Uh, and they're eaten by a variety of predators too, but not today though. I wanted to give a little bit of time to talk about my most recent work, which is can we now link predator effects um, to ecosystem function? How much time do I have? I think I have plenty of time, good. Um, so, you know, ultimately the goal of a lot of the work in recent years is to not just talk about predator effects, but to be able to predict effects on ecosystems given the changes in the environment and especially of predators. Predators are the most likely to be introduced to new ecosystems and they're the most likely thing to be driven extinct in food webs. And so understanding how those changes in predator diversity affect the function of those ecosystems is a really important matter. And we know um, from lots of studies that in general, if you increase the diversity of plants, you increase their function, plant biomass production. Right? So this is a pretty straightforward prediction. And we can also pretty well predict that if we increase the diversity of herbivores feeding on a monoculture plant, that reduces plant bio biomass. So it would stand to reason that if we did the same thing and we increase the diversity of predators feeding on an herbivore, that we'd increase plant biomass production through this trophic cascade. But it turns out, as I've already mentioned many times, this is actually not so easy to predict. And so as you now add many more predators feeding on a shared prey, you get these complex multi-consumer interactions that make it difficult to predict. And sometimes we see an increase in diversity, sometimes we see no effect, and sometimes we see a negative effect. And so this has led to people referring to this as, as diversity effects of predators, which is another name for emergent effects. And part of the problem is that we're still using a multiple predator, now in this case more than two, version of that multiplicative risk model. We're still making this additive constant predation rate assumption. And so what I wanted to sort of do is say, can we do better than that and actually come up with a way to predict how changes in multiple predators, not just two, affect ecosystems. And I'm going to tell you much of the same story again. And so, but to do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we deal with this complexity. And one way that's been used to deal with this complexity is to say, well, let's not worry about species diversity. Let's identify functional diversity. We'll just measure functional traits and try to link those traits to the function in the ecosystem. And that's worked really well for plants because plants have these shared characteristics like they're green and they have leaves, but it doesn't work so well for predators because they don't necessarily have shared characteristics. Some have claws and some have mouths and some do other things. And so it's hard to, to find a, identify general traits for predators. And so I want to talk a little bit about how people have attempted to do that. And one way, and this is by Oz Smits and others, is to try to identify things about their behavior or their spatial location as a way of, of identifying functionality. So in this case, 
It's referred to as habitat domains, and this would be, for example, if you have a sit and wait predator that's low in the, in the canopy of a herbaceous system, and another predator that's uh, an active forager that's high in the canopy, they would be unlikely to interact in a way that would cause an emergent effect on this prey. They could be independent, right? So it's just basing it on their hunting style and their spatial preference in their niche. And I'm going to refer to these as idiosyncratic functional traits because they only apply to the specific species that are there and to a specific system. You can't really generalize that effect to another system because it's only relevant to those species. Another form of idiosyncratic trait is what I'm going to refer to as consumption traits. These are things like measuring claw size or gape size or body size or uh, things that you think determine the ability of a predator to actually consume a prey. Right. Again, these are only relevant to the species that you're looking at. You can't generalize those to compare different kinds of predator systems. Then we have aggregate ways of quantifying function. This is like things like body size or allometric scaling, which just assumes that you can predict predator-prey interaction strength just based on the relative size of the predator and the prey. And this incorporates some of the variation we expect to be encapsulated in consumption traits like gape size and some of the variation we expect due to habitat preferences, but it doesn't incorporate all of that variation, so it's sort of this aggregate description. And then more recently, the most common way people have identified functional traits is via phylogenetic distance. And the assumption here is that a predator community consisting of individuals that are located close together on a phylogenetic tree are going to be more similar to each other than predators that are distant on that same phylogenetic tree. And so we just can use phylogenetic distance as a surrogate for functional diversity. Again, this captures some of the traits associated with consumption ability and behavior, but not all of it, and it doesn't necessarily correlate at all with body size. And so we need a better way of doing this because none of these have worked out too well. And as I've already mentioned, we have a way of incorporating all of these um, approaches, and that is by modeling prey risk, the primary function of predators is prey suppression, so the number eaten, as a function of density and size. And so if we can use these size-dependent functional response models, we can actually maybe incorporate lots of the variation encapsulated in these things as a way of defining um, functional diversity. And so how do we do that? Well, these models have a bunch of traits associated with them. And we could take the parameters from the models and use those as functional traits because they describe what the predators do, how many prey they eat. And so what we've done is we've developed a generalized model for multiple predators. And so just not going to go through the details of this, but for, so for any number of predators, K, eating a prey, shared prey, we can incorporate size dependent risk uh, for any size structured prey population. And we can incorporate into that changes in growth rate of the prey as well as increased variation in growth rate that might be generated by the predation itself or other aspects of the environment. And this is, of course, recruitment of the prey and recruitment of the predator. And so what this generates, the, sort of the moral of the story here, is I'm showing you now proportion surviving of prey. And this is for a cohort, starting off with, uh, in this case, three predators. We see this initial decrease as the predators start consuming prey. And then as we go through time, we see that this curve starts to move out. It starts to saturate. We get reduced predation rates as the prey are depleted. But you also see that prey size is increasing through time. So we get this reduction in prey abundance through time and this increase in prey size. And you might also be able to notice that the width of that hump is getting larger because prey are growing at different rates. So we can incorporate all of these dynamics simultaneously into a multiple predator model. And the key things that determine the shape of this surface are the parameters I showed you in that size dependent functional response. Things like handling time and attack rate, which can vary as a function of size specific functions like in a Ricker function or the size of the size window. So we could take all of these parameters from these models that have real biological meaning about the risk of prey to be to predators and say those are the functional traits of the predators. Now how does this help us? Well, we can quantify these for any predator and they have the same meaning. A claw size in one system is different than the meaning of claw size in another system. An attack rate is always an attack rate. It's the number of prey eaten per time. So now we can take those parameters and incorporate them into a multivariate description of functional diversity that's used in things like plants, in this case, functional dispersion. And so the dots on this, I just put it in two dimensions for simplicity. 
We have attack rate on the x-axis and some measure of size dependence on the y, for example. So each one of these dots represents a different species of predator. And so this predator has this attack rate and that size dependence. The size of the dot represents the relative abundance of that predator species in the ecosystem. And the sort of defining characteristic here is a centroid, which is weighted by the abundance. Now the distance of every point from that centroid is a measure of its functional dispersion. Right? Sum up all of those lines and you get a measure of functional diversity of the predator community. And the centroid tells you the average parameter set or the average consumption expected when you run it through the model. So now we have this sort of description of the community where we can predict the effect of prey for any given set of predators. Does this actually work better than these other approaches? Well, it's really hard to find a data set that has all of those information that we can compare them. So what we did is we used a, a, a Brownian motion evolution model and we allowed communities to evolve with these different predators so we could define the number of species and then we randomly select species from those tips that have different trait combinations and ask whether or not we get a strong correlation with function, prey suppression. And we can compare that to the phylogenetic distance or body size which we allow to evolve independently. And again, we see actually our functional response approach provides better prediction in terms of the effect of predators on the prey in terms of prey suppression with increasing functional diversity relative to the phylogenetic distance and size-based approaches. So we're doing pretty good here, right? But not that much better than this. But there's still a distinction is that we can do prediction with our model where with phylogenetic distance, there's no real way to link a particular distance in phylogeny to a specific function. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to go back to this multivariate description of functional diversity. Now I'm going to show it to you in three dimensions just to make this a little bit more visually accessible. And so here's the same thing, except now I have three parameters, attack rate, handling time, and size dependence. This black dot here is the centroid of that predator community. And so again, each one of these colored dots represents a predator species. And so what we can do with this, since we can feed this through our model and make predictions, we can say, what's going to happen if some of these predators are driven extinct? We can actually do a quantitative prediction of how the community is going to change and how ecosystem function is going to change. Because when those predators disappear, we know exactly what's going to happen to the centroid. It's going to move to here. So we get a measure of how functional diversity has changed and we can directly link that to function via the, the predictions of the model. And so we can say, predict a priori how the loss of a particular predator species from the food web is going to change the entire system in a quantitative way. So does this work? Well. We don't know yet, but we're working on it. So this is uh, a recent grant, that, so we've just developed the theoretical part and the statistical models. And now we're testing it in this rock pool system in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And these rock pools are really useful for a variety of reasons. First is they're easy to characterize because you could just go and dip them out. They're basically five gallon buckets in a granite rock. So you can take everything out of them and quantify it. You can also easily simulate them with five gallon buckets. So you can do mesocosm experiments that are semi-realistic and because of the organisms that occupy them. And so in these rock pools, we have a single dominant grazer, so our single herbivore. In this case, it's a Fisa uh, pond snail. It's got 90% occupancy in these pools and it has a huge range in densities, ranging from zero to 600 per meter square. Another good thing about these is that they have strong effects on the ecosystem. I'm just showing you an example here of a rock pool with, without snails and a rock pool with snails and you can see there's clear ecosystem effects of the snails. And they co-occur with 11 different species of predators, most of which have size dependent functional responses. And so we're quantifying and we now for seven of these have these size dependent functional responses so we have all the parameter sets and we can feed them through our model and make predictions about how different combinations of predators and how predator diversity because we can actually do phylogenetic distance here and how each one of those works in terms of predicting what happens in this real system. And the other great thing about the system is if you can see all of those little tiny marks on there, black spots, those are all rock pools. We literally have thousands of replicate ecosystems to do this in. And so, and it's spatially explicit to get back to my first point about these food webs in space. And so we've also been taking, I'll just show you quick just to wake you up. You can see where this site is located. We've been able to take drones and do flyovers and we have really high resolution maps of this system. And you can see right here is metropolitan Richmond, so we're right in 
urban area, which has a, a tremendous outreach component. So we did this flyover with these drones. And what that's allowed us to do is if we just focus in on a couple of poles here, so we get real high resolution images. And we can actually see whether or not they're algae dominated or not. And we've geo-referenced each one of these and we have an app where you can go in and click on it. It tells you which pool you're at and what's known to be in that pool. And we have a, an identification that's for citizen science. But the other thing it does is it gives us really, really detailed topographic information. So we can actually now during flooding events know which pools connect and which pools don't which ones are going to be isolated for longer and therefore the predator community is more distinct than those that aren't. And so we're incorporating all of that into sort of a spatially explicit version of this model. Does it work? I don't know. We're collecting, we just finished collecting the first summer's data. So I don't know if you come back next year, maybe I'll be able to tell you, does our model work? But we think it does. So I'd like to thank my collaborators in funding and I'd be happy to take questions. Bringing from the fire hose, I know, I've been told that before. So it's really cool how you add components to the predator framework to, to capture more complexity and, and seems to be predicting. In terms of trophic cascade, one complicating factor people have, have pointed out for a while is uh, food chain on the emperor. That's kind of a, a real bugger. Mm -hmm. And you got things like intergill predation. It yes. kind of breaks down that whole HSS model. Have you thought about a way to integrate that? Yes. Model? So we're hoping to. So a lot of the predators that I showed you that are in our system eat each other. And so we're hoping that, that we'll be able to incorporate some aspect of that by looking at, especially like dragonflies, for example. We can get a pretty good sense of the intergill predation risk based on a relative uh, instar of the, of the dragonflies. So what you tend to see is when you go to the, one of these pools is a whole bunch of dragonfly larvae that are all the same instar because all those ones that were smaller got eaten. And so for some of them I think we can incorporate those size dependent predictions for intergill predation. For others like fish it might not be as easy. Fish eating crayfish for example. But um, our models I should say are the null expectation for independent interactions. So by incorporating those nonlinearities, any deviations from our model predictions are more likely to be these true emergent effects due to some other process that's not just not accounting for known nonlinear processes like intergill predation or interference. Um, so it's basically generating a better null model rather than incorporating all possible versions. What about um, in some of these models, the other side of the corner, like I, I really like the, you know, how the species centroid will shift and give you pretty predictability when predators are removed. Mm -hmm. But what about position of predators, like invasive alien predators? Yeah, so absolutely. And so some of this, I, I did a fellowship in South Africa when I was developing some of this for the Center for Invasion Biology. And, and exactly, we, that was sort of the original idea is that we could, if we knew the characteristics of the predator for the most common prey item, we could add that to the system and also predict where the centroid would move. So for example, if it's, if it's got a, a parameter set that's very different from the, from the existing predator community, it's going to have a big effect on that centroid. So you might expect a big change in the ecosystem and maybe more invasibility. We haven't tested that yet, but we certainly think that it would work for doing that. So you should be able to, just like removing them changes the centroid, we should be able to predict how adding one changes the centroid, all, as long as we know it's parameter set. It's complicated because it also depends on the whole issue of the population actually becomes established. Yes. Yeah. Invasion is, invasibility is different than presence. Yeah, I, I completely agree. But if we can use the relative abundance as a metric of how big of an effect it's having, we might be able to get at that a little bit. But I haven't explored that with the models yet. I hope to. So to what extent can you rescue this uh, Substitutive design changes the form of the bias, but it's just as biased as the additive design. And so I, I went kind of through fast through that, but those four different panels I showed were two additive designs and two substitutive designs.
And so you get the opposite directions of bias for correcting, but essentially the problem is when you have two predators, you just get faster depletion. And so you don't actually correct for it by, the more different the two predators become, the bigger the bias because you get more depletion by one predator than the other predator. And so you get still the same bias. It doesn't actually solve the problem in that case. That's how it was originally proposed is to do these substitutive designs where you keep density constant but change diversity would prevent this problem, but it actually exacerbates it in some cases. Okay, thank you. Just another thought. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you're focusing on some of the functional traits of the predators. Are you also in some of these systems looking at the, the functional traits of the prey? At this point, no, because we have the single prey that we're focused on, but the thing that's really nice about this prey is that it's also known to have strong anti-predator responses. So they change both the shape and thickness of the shell in response to crayfish and fish in different ways, and they have strong behavioral responses. So they either bury in the, in the sand or they crawl out of the water. And so it gives us a chance to say how important are these known phenotypic responses for being able to predict the system. Um, so I did an experiment with those snails between the fish and crayfish as predators. Mm -hmm. uh, it also tracked natural selection, you know, measured the selection differential on shell shape. Uh -huh. And in the, you could measure the predation rate between the egg, treat the meat, and then in the combined treatment, the, the, the prey got really hammered because there's no uh, defensive space. Right. The trait combinations. But the neat thing about it was, when I actually measured the selection differential in that combined predator treatment, mm -hmm. I didn't watch them. I didn't know who was doing the mass predation and creating the multiple predator. But the selection differential in every replicate was exactly the creation. Huh. So it's actually the change in prey traits that told me the identity of the predator. Of the predator. Huh. That's a really interesting idea, yeah. Yeah, so um, we, we've got a version of the same model that I showed, this sort of PDE model. We've done the same thing in an in um, agent-based model, so individual-based modeling approach. So we have the exact same model but using individual-based. So we can incorporate individual behavioral responses. And so we're quantifying morphological and behavioral responses of the predators too. And so we can compare the PDE predictions versus the individual-based predictions and see how, how important are those phenotypic responses. And in this case, these guys go through four to five generations in a summer. And so we can actually get multiple generational predictions, which is the real sort of, if we can do that, it would be fantastic, but that's a big if. Yes, and so we, we do have some temperature chambers going at the moment, and so we're quantifying the growth rates of the snails under different resource input rates because of the different rock pools have different sort of flooding regimes and leaf inputs, and then across temperatures gradients. And so we're, at least at some superficial level going to be able to think about the nonlinearities due to temperature. Um, another prey species in the system that we're doing these simultaneous experiments with is mosquitoes. There's a rock pool mosquito that's endemic. And so we're doing the same kinds of things with mosquitoes and their predators, um, sort of generalize it a bit. But. Uh, I was wondering what kind of effect you, uh, you would predict or maybe already observed um, like the interaction between the reproductive rates of the prey and the various predators. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, we're also collecting those data. I should just keep saying that. So actually these snails, the other really good thing about them is they can reproduce sexually or asexually. And so they can, we, we've been able to do that and we've also got um, inbred lines and outcross lines to sort of think about genetic variation. And so one of the things we're quantifying in these experiments is um, size dependent egg production in the presence and absence of predators with different resource availabilities. So we'll be able to incorporate that into our PDE model in terms of the growth dynamics. And so it's one of the benefits of the system is that the snails are so amenable to really getting at sort of turnover rates um, because you're, you can go count. <laughs> they put these jelly masses on the sides of the containers and you can put them under scope and actually just count all the embryos in there um, developing snails. So. So hopefully the reproductive rates are changing. We do know they do change, and that will affect the sort of longer-term dynamics um, that you might need. Be able to capture things like sort of like cyclic explosive breeding type organisms as well, things oh. like Asian carp or like the rabbits, uh, like rabbit stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, being able to incorporate that into the size-dependent recruitment function at the, that was the lower equation in our model, we can maybe sort of get at some of that because um, you can tweak those parameters pretty easily, at least theoretically. I don't know if we'll be able to do it 
experimentally. So whenever you look at the potential shift in the incentive rate in response to the loss of the credit, you predict the value that's going to be conditioned upon the functional responses of the credit remaining constant. You may have release, uh, competitive release and, and shifts in the strength of the responses also. Is there a way you can tease that out? Uh, yeah, so I think the, the primary way we can tease that out is this is, like, like I was saying, this is the null prediction. And if the system doesn't behave the way we expect it to, then we should go in and say, is there something like that changing the shape of the functional responses given the loss of those predators? So that would have suggested that there was some emergent, context-dependent, higher-order, trait-mediated, whatever you want to call it, effect. Um, and so, yeah, this is, again, trying to generate that null expectation, and then deviations would suggest that kind of response. All right. So we do have happy hour tonight at 5.30 at Block T Bar. I'm excited to see this. I've heard a lot about it. And we also have 